Hello guys, my name is Kiara and today I'll be talking about the 120 year old unsolved murder of Michael, Ellen and Nora Murphy, more commonly known as the Gatton Murts. Before we get started, I'd just like to mention that this case will contain graphic themes and pictures and will contain discussions of rape, murder and incest, which may be upsetting to some viewers. I'd also just like to say that I don't mean any disrespect to anyone in this case, I'm simply researching it and sharing it with you all. I'm not trying to solve this case today, I'm just trying to keep the public aware since it's one of Australia's longest standing unsolved murders. So if you're interested in true crime or a local of Gatton, I really think you'd like this one. So firstly, I'd just like to touch a little bit on the background on the Murphy family. So Daniel Murphy and Mary Holland were immigrants to Australia who fled Ireland in the 1860s due to the famine. They moved to Gatton in Queensland to seek a better life. Daniel Murphy found work assisting in the construction of the Toowoomba Ipswich Railway Line where he would eventually meet Mary. They went on to buy a farm in Blackfellows Creek of 10 Hill, 13 kilometres outside of Gatton. Mary and Daniel would soon marry and go on to parent 10 children. They were comfortable financially and well-respected members of the community and known for their hard work. By 1898, Polly, the eldest child of the Murphys, had married William McNeil, much to the dismay of the family due to his Protestant religion and his black Irish heritage. Leading up to the murders, Polly had moved home with her husband and two children after a fall that left her partially paralysed, no longer able to take care of her family. Aside from Polly, all the children were unmarried and most lived at home. Daniel Jr. was a police constable in Brisbane and Michael was working on a government farm in Westbrook. He was previously a part-time volunteer at the Shearer's strike of 1891 as well. William Jeremiah and John Murphy all worked with their father on the farm. The boys would also pick up odd jobs such as roadworks and fencing. The last son, Patrick, was a labourer. The three girls, Nora, Ellen and Katie, all helped with their mother around the home. Mrs Murphy was known to be quite strict and protective of her children and didn't want the girls to be without one of their brothers, even if they were just out riding their horses. She didn't approve of any of her children's suitors, including Polly's husband, which would indicate why nine of her ten children had never married. Michael Murphy had a bit of a reputation around the town and was considered to be a womaniser. He was rumoured to have impregnated two local women who were friends of the Murphys, and much to their disappointment, Michael had no intention of making an honest woman out of them. The first woman, Katie Ryan, gave birth to a stillborn, but the second woman, Edith May Cook, died from septicemia due to complications from an illegal abortion. Cook's death came on the 27th of December, 1896, two years prior to the horrific murders that tore the Murphy family apart. On the 26th of December, 1898, William and Polly McNeil and Michael and Ellen Murphy had gone to an annual Boxing Day races at, held at Mount Sylvia. Nora Murphy, however, didn't attend the races as she was looking after her sister's baby, a role she took extremely seriously. But Michael had promised he'd take Nora and Ellen to a dance later that night in Gatton, so she didn't mind too much. At 8pm that night, Nora, Ellen and Michael took their horse and William McNeil's sulky and set out to a dance at the Divisional Board Hall in Gatton. Mrs Murphy, remembering the last time that she saw her children alive, said that when each girl left, they had a laugh upon their face. At 9pm when they got there, they discovered the dance had been cancelled due to there not being an even boy-to-girl ratio in attendance, something that was mandatory at the time. After chatting with some friends at the hall, they left for home, but they would never make it. When Mr Murphy awoke at 5am the next morning, he discovered that the stove had not been turned on like it usually was, meaning his children were not home. But he was not worried, as country dancers could sometimes last long into the next morning and they could have been still travelling home. Shortly after this, William McNeil rose and before long he expressed some concern as a soggy he'd allowed the siblings to borrow had a broken wheel. He was worried they'd been in an accident. He expressed his concerns with Mrs Murphy who suggested he should set off to Gatton in search for the siblings. He rode his horse past a neighbouring O'Brien farm where he asked if he'd seen the siblings. They hadn't, so McNeil continued along the Lower Ten Hill Road towards Gatton. He was only about 15 minutes outside of Gatton when he recognised the wobbly wheel markings on the road as his own sulky he'd let the siblings borrow. The tracks came from a direction of Gatton indicating that they'd been on their way home and it seemed to veer off towards Moorland's paddock. He followed the tracks further until he got into the paddock. In here, McNeil saw what he thought was a heap of clothing and a horse and car. On further inspection, he realised it was the siblings. He approached them and this is where he saw it. He is reported saying, I thought they were sleeping in the sun. After I got a bit closer, I saw the clothing of the girls was disarranged and then I could see ants crawling all over them. He immediately fled to Gatton for help without looking any closer. He arrived at the Brian Borough Hotel where he informed the owner George Gilbert and the customers in there that the three Murphys were lying dead in a paddock. Gilbert took him to the police station where he explained the story to Sergeant Arrell. They immediately took off on horseback towards Moran's paddock where the bodies were located. In the haste, Sergeant Arrow had forgotten his notepad and hadn't brought another police officer with him. 
The body placement was quite particular. The bodies had formed a triangle. Nora's body was laid out on a neatly spread rug at the base of a tree with her feet pointing westward. She had a massive blow to the left side of her head which had shattered her skull, causing her brain to protrude out. However, she also had a breaching strap around her neck that was tied enough that it would have caused death. Her hands were tied behind her back with a handkerchief. She was face down on the rug and blood had pooled around her mouth, possibly from the blow to her head. Her breasts were exposed and her skirt was pushed up, revealing her thighs. Her face was badly scratched and she had a large knife wound on her face. Her knees and the backs of her hand had serious abrasions. At the next point of the triangle were the bodies of Michael and Ellen. Their feet were also pointing westward and they were back to back, less than a metre apart. Ellen's clothing remained intact, but she had suffered two blows to the left side of her head with blood pooling beneath it also. Her hands were tied with a handkerchief. Both girls were found to have been outraged, meaning raped, by a brass handle of a whip that was never recovered by police. Michael too had suffered a violent blow to his head, but on the right side. He was, however, killed by a gunshot wound located in the same area as a blow to his head. It was discovered that Michael and Ellen had been struck at the same time. Michael laid face down on his left side. His knees were bent with one leg on top of the other. His hands were bent back, clutching his coin purse. His tie had been tossed beside him, showing signs that he'd previously been tied up. It is possible that either McNeil, the murderer, or someone else had untied him, though, to get access to the money in his purse he was clasping. At the third point of the triangle, roughly nine metres from Nora, lay the horse Tom. His hair was singed around the bullet hole in his head and the harness was still attached to his body. The breaching strap and the understrap had been removed, one laying between Michael and Ellen. The reins had been brought forward, showing signs that Tom was most likely led. The case from the get-go was doomed. When McNeil sought out Sergeant Arrow for help, he arrived and explained the story. Sergeant Arrow leaving in a hurry to go to the crime scene did not take his notebook with him, nor did he bring another officer to assist. Some men from the pub came with them too, and once they arrived, the sergeant told him to stop anyone from coming near the bodies, but did not tell them to remove themselves from the paddock. The track, the paddock, and the slip rails were contaminated, and Sergeant Arrow wanted to prevent further corruption of the scene. However, news quickly spread through the town, attracting gawkers to the scene, and the sergeant failed to prevent further contamination. People had come to gawk, and Sergeant Arrow had not had adequate police backup to restrain the crowd. Shortly after returning to the scene, McNeil went to tell the Murphy family of the tragedy that had occurred. This is where Sergeant Arrow made a second mistake. He did not question McNeil before he left the scene, nor did he confirm where he walked or his alibi from the previous night. Shortly after this occurred, Sergeant Arrow told the men from the pub to secure the crime scene so he could make an urgent telegram to the Brisbane police for assistance. Yet again, the case was hindered. When arriving at the telegram office, Sergeant Arrow told the attendant he needed to make an urgent telegram to Brisbane, to which... The attendant incorrectly told him he couldn't. Sergeant Arrow then made an ordinary telegram to Brisbane that would not be seriously acknowledged until the 28th of December. While Sergeant Arrow was making the telegram and waiting the 30 minutes for the reply that never came, McNeil arrived back at the Murphy house to explain what had happened. Neither parent seemed shocked, but Mr Murphy asked if his children had been shot. Mrs Murphy asked to go to the crime scene to see the bodies. McNeil took her back to the crime scene where men from the pub were trying to prevent the bodies from being seen. However, they failed and soon allowed McNeil, Mrs Murphy and two gawkers access to the scene. Before long, many others had come to look and it is reported that as many as 40 different people were at the scene when Sergeant Arrow arrived back. According to historian Jack Sam, people came into the crime scene, moved the bodies, took souvenirs and contaminated it as a whole. If the sergeant had been able to get a black tracker in to assist on the case, or if he had an assistant to set up the scene, evidence could have been preserved and the murderer possibly could have been apprehended. When the telegram was sent, the runner who received it was unsure where he could take it due to the Christmas holidays. He went to two different buildings before handing it to a constable who wouldn't pass on the message until the next day. Inspector Urquhart was the Brisbane police inspector who would eventually come to Gatton to assist on the case with Sergeant Arrow. He explained that the reason he didn't take action sooner was because he believed the message was actually a hoax. Constable Murphy, the brother of the victims, at first could not believe the awful news and thought his family was trying to just lure him back for the Christmas holidays, but when they realised it was real, he was immediately relieved of his duties and left for Gatton right away with the inspector. In 1899, a Royal Commission investigated the methods used by the Brisbane Police Force to see if there was any corruption in the case. Inspector Urquhart expressed that Sergeant Arrow did all he could with the resources he had and denied stating the case was a hoax, but was concerned about the legitimacy of the murders due to the lack of information. The examination of the bodies that was performed was just another issue in the case. Once Sergeant Arrow was happy with the information and evidence that was recovered from the scene, the bodies were moved to the Bryanborough Hotel. 
Taking the bodies to a pub may contaminate them further and considering the corruption of the crime scene and the bodies, this would have made finding the murderer even worse. An Ipswich medical examiner, Dr. von Losberg, performed the external examination at around 4pm that afternoon, which revealed specifics of the case that Sergeant Arrow had not originally seen. Dr. von Losberg discovered a hole in Michael's head, but he didn't find the bullets so concluded that he was not shot. The bodies were exhumed at a later date and re-examined where it was discovered that Michael was in fact killed by a gunshot wound and not the blow to the head. Dr. von Losberg stated that he was suffering from blood poisoning at the time of the examination and was given the hurry up to finish quickly rather than accurately. The bodies were quickly released after the original examination and prepared to be buried the next day at the request of Mrs. Murphy. There was a variety of evidence that Sergeant Arrow noted at the crime scene, although most of it was unable to be used. There was no DNA testing at the time of the murder, so any fibre or blood was unable to be tested like today. Semen was found on one of the girls' dresses which could not be tested, along with the bloody sticks used to bash the siblings and their bloody clothing that was recovered, all unable to be tested. Regardless of whether the clothing could be tested or not, the crime scene was extremely contaminated and the black trackers would find it difficult to determine the killer's tracks and movements. A damning piece of evidence that was discovered at the scene linked the murders to the death of Edith May Cook, the woman who died of septicemia after allegedly aborting Michael's baby she was carrying. There are roughly 3,000 statements taken in the weeks after the murders, but no arrests or convictions were ever made, partly due to the lack of evidence that could have been linked to suspects. The media kept this crime alive for quite a while, with daily updates every week for some time. Most of the reports were similar, due to the extremely slow nature of the case, however the newspapers were reporting on the hundreds of letters that police were being sent. Almost everyone had a different angle, including the claim that Michael and his sisters were romantically involved on the night of the murders. Psychics came forward claiming the killer had come to them in a dream, or among the more bizarre letters the police were tasked with sifting through. Newspaper articles were written up until the 1920s, more than 20 years after the murders took place. As recently as 1973, a man phoned a police unit describing a memory of his mother telling him that she knew who shot the Murphy siblings and their horse Tom. Even today, the murders are still discussed in modern day media. An article written in 2015 explicitly focuses on the Gatton murders, outlining some theories and potential suspects. The article allows for the case to stay in the public eye and for the victims to be remembered. I'd firstly just like to mention that this case has so many theories, but for the sake of this video and time length, I'll only be focusing on the four most reasonable ones. The first suspect I'll be talking about is Thomas Day. Day had numerous aliases and was quite suspicious regarding the murders. He'd recently just moved to Gatton and gotten a job as a butcher. He was living close to the scene of the crime on the night of the murder and was allegedly washing blood from a jumper near the slip rails on the night. However, he did work as a butcher, so this wasn't considered too suspicious. He was allegedly in love with Edith May Cook, the woman who died after Michael Murphy impregnated her, and there was a note found at the crime scene regarding her death, and the murders came two years after her own death. This would indicate that the crime was revenge-based. Day was barely questioned by Inspector Urquhart and quickly left after the murders, seeking permission from the inspector who allowed him convinced that someone else was responsible. Day left to join the military, but records show that he never enlisted and disappeared from every record, possibly changing his name again. He allegedly died in a Sydney hotel under another alias in 1900 after a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The second theory I'll be talking about is Joe Quinn. Quinn, like Tom Stay, had a number of aliases and quite a lengthy criminal record to his name. During the Shearer strike of 1891, Michael Murphy was a constable in charge of keeping the peace. Joe Quinn was among those who attended the strike, and the two men allegedly met here. According to author Stephanie Bennett, Michael recognised Quinn, who was under a different alias at the time, in a barbershop in Longreach where he exposed Quinn's long criminal history by notifying the authorities. Quinn was put into jail for a year, expressing to his fellow inmates that he'd have his revenge once he was out. On his release, he travelled to Gatton and enacting the assistance of a group of youths who killed the three Murphys on Boxing Day 1898. Bennett's theory further explains that Quinn involved a number of people who wanted to enact revenge on Michael Murphy, including the O'Briens who were relatives of Katie Ryan, the woman that Michael impregnated. The O'Briens were avenging Katie Ryan and Quinn was getting revenge for his imprisonment by Michael Murphy. However, local historian Jack Sim believes the murder was simply a crime of convenience. If the murder was planned, the murderer would not have been at the slip rails for many more hours until after the dance. The dance was then unexpectedly cancelled and the Murphys were attacked on their way home, indicating why Sim believes it to be a crime of convenience and even perhaps a robbery gone wrong rather than a planned murder targeting the Murphy siblings. 
The final theory I'll be discussing is quite bizarre. Mr. and Mrs. Murphy were quite unhelpful in the case, which caused people to speculate. They seemed more concerned with their image rather than finding the killers of their three children. Mr. Murphy claims he didn't want to see any more lives lost in the affair. He is also quoted saying he could go straight to the murderers. This indicated inside knowledge of the murders and confusion as to why he would not go forward and catch the people responsible for the brutal slaying of his children. However, one of the most popular Murphy theories was the claim that Michael, Nora and Ellen were involved in incestuous activity on the night of the murders. Michael was very close with his sisters and the family were quite affectionate which fueled these rumours further. On the night of the murders, an unnamed witness claimed she heard screams of father and the sound of gunshots around the time the murder allegedly took place. It's believed that Mr Murphy followed the siblings deep into the paddock that night, suspecting the relationship and witnessed the act. Mr Murphy allegedly grew angry and bludgeoned the siblings to the point of overkill to stop the relationship between his children. The police received hundreds of letters from the public expressing their own incest theories with many posted in newspapers. Unfortunately, it is unlikely we're ever going to know who the murderer of the Murphy siblings was. And in 1998, 100 years after the murder, the bloody dresses the girls were wearing on the night were discarded from evidence from the police department in Ipswich due to too much time being elapsed and the murderer would have already been dead. So there was no need to pursue this case any further. A year after the murders, Gavin as a community erected a large memorial in the local cemetery to commemorate the siblings, which is still standing today in pristine condition. So that's everything from this case for today guys. I really hope you all enjoyed this video and please let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you next time.